The Centre for Next Generation Localisation, or CNGL, was, it's funded by Science Foundation Ireland as a centre for science, engineering and technology. So CNGL is uh, an academia industry partnership. The task, the brief, is to develop the technologies, uh, methods, processes uh, for next generation localisation. I like to think of it in ideal terms, which is a product that's been localised looks feels and behaves as though it was created indigenously within that country. A large part of localization is of course translation, but there's much more to it. It's uh, You have to adapt to cultural norms, preferences, color codes. The way we represent uh, time, the way we represent dates, the way we represent data is, is not the same all across the world. In Germany they use a comma instead of a full stop as a decimal point separator, for example. Two countries, even if they share the language, the same language, they might call things differently. Like, for example, we call petrol petrol here in, in Ireland, and in the US they call it gas. I can remember a situation uh, many, many years ago going down to Japan, and if you made a small effort to speak Japanese when you were interacting with Japanese companies, it just Im improved the relationship tenfold there, because they just thought this was very respectful of you to make that effort. And I think localization is just a bigger picture of that. We're respecting those clients and the benefit is an economic benefit. We get more sales out of it. A lot of companies are seeing that the importance of localization very early on. Smaller companies, particularly if their product is web-based, their audience by nature is global immediately. There was a recent study there done by Common Sense Advisory which um, states that I think um, a native speaker is three times more likely to buy your product if they're interacting with a website that's in their language than if you left your website in, say, just a single language, such as English. We sell a global customer a product and when that global customer has an issue or a question, it has to be core to what we do to communicate with that customer. And we want to communicate to that customer in their language and we want to answer the problem that they have, not the problem we think they might have, but the problem that they have. The language is extremely important, it's intrinsic with any culture, and that's not going to change and shouldn't change any day soon. I think there's a key element to consider around the preservation of languages, the preservation of cultures, that's very much enabled by the provision of content and information in those languages. There's actually a drive Despite all of the globalization that's going on, there is a drive for people to protect their culture and their individuality through language. It's really interesting to see how people are working together to protect those kinds of differences. The program that I work on is a local language program. We have 60 languages um, and we're trying to bridge the technology divide for some of the, um, some of the indigenous communities. We're trying to get access to IT to the communities. Sometimes language is the barrier there and this program helps to bridge that divide. There's some, some vast, um, or very, very big challenges facing localization at the moment. And these challenges are volume, access, and personalization. Uh, volume is just too much stuff that needs to be localized. We simply don't have enough human translators on the planet, even if we doubled, tripled, or quadrupled the number of, of human translators. If you look at you know, websites, for example, companies uh, update their websites, not just once every month, but you know, several times a day. And you can't keep going back to human translators with that material to, to translate. On a, on a regular basis, it's far too slow. If you bought a product and you've got some sort of problems, often you go on the web and find content there. And, you know, often that's provided by, you know, other, other users and, you know, there's no, there's no way of easily translating that. People in different countries that have content that they want to share, people in different countries that want to get access to content, they need to be enabled to localise that content and, and to share it. And there's been a shift towards uh, content that is uh, for people to access on the go. So there's e-book readers, there's uh, uh, PDAs, there's mobile phones. And content's being accessed in these contexts and in different locations. In that context, different modalities, in, ad in addition to text and pictures, come into play, such as, for example, speech technology. If you have a small device, it would be really nice if you could, if you could talk into the device and the device understands you and sort of like, you know, uh, interacts with digital content like that. Or if rather uh, than, than you having to look at a, at a small, tiny screen, the device might talk to you. 
mm -hmm. might get some text and then uh, synthesize that into human speech so you can actually listen to the device. If you look at today, we tend to use a, a search engine. If you look at the average, we aim to about 2.5 words to three words, and we expect uh, information to be retrieved for us. The idea is to overlay the coarse-grained localization, which localizes according to language family, local, uh, to overlay that with a more fine-grained net. You know, is that a teenager or is that, I don't know, some manager from Shanghai that's trying to access some, some information.